A couple of weeks back, I had the idea of making a video about seven footballers who we may have written off too soon. That is to say, players who have been largely denigrated or forgotten about who I think could make comebacks and prove a lot of people wrong in the future. Now, I put up a post on Twitter asking for some of your suggestions of players who you think might fit that bill, but I probably didn't explain myself very well, and most people responded by naming players who were previously written off too soon and have already proven people wrong. I'm talking about the Mohamed Salahs and Kevin De Bruyne's of this world, and you can take it from their honourable mentions there that those two are not going to feature. So as a result, today I'm going to be covering players who were previously written off too soon and have already proven those who did so wrong. And then in the coming weeks, provided this video doesn't absolutely bomb, hopefully I will make a current, more speculative version for you all. Before I start, I just had one of my infrequent Google Meet conversations with my YouTube partner manager who says I'm still doing a rubbish job of telling you all to subscribe at the start of my videos. Apparently, only a quarter of people who watch HITC7's videos are actually subscribed, despite the fact that most of them are returning viewers, which she says is because I don't ask people to subscribe at the start of the videos, I ask at the end. So if you're one of those people who enjoy my videos but still don't subscribe, yes that's right, I'm talking to you, then go ahead and do it so that I don't keep getting in trouble. Right, hopefully I'm not far off a million subs now if you've all done that, since let's face it, no channel deserves it more. Here are seven footballers who were written off too soon. Luka Modric. Oof, we're off to a strong start, with a man who shows just how impatient Real Madrid fans can be at times. If you were able to cast your minds back as far as those heady days of 2012, when the Summer Olympics descended upon London and David Cameron accidentally left his eight-year-old daughter in a pub, then you might be able to recall Luka Modric's drawn-out transfer saga with Real Madrid. Daniel Levy is the type of man who wouldn't budge an inch when it comes to haggling, even if he ran a stand-up borough market, and his famous stubbornness meant Real Madrid didn't get their hands on Modric until right at the end of the 2012 summer transfer window. Modric didn't enjoy the luxury of a pre-season in the Spanish capital, thrust straight into a Spanish Super Cup within 36 hours of his arrival. Back in those days, Modric played very much as a number 10. He had been brilliant at Tottenham, finding space, linking play, and creating chances, but he found Meza Ozil tough to dislodge at the Bernabeu in his debut campaign. The German was at his scintillating best under Jose Mourinho at that time, and with Xabi Alonso and Sami Khedira sitting, Modric was largely confined to the bench. A 2012 poll by Spanish newspaper Marca named Modric as La Liga's worst signing in 2012. Eight years on, the Croatian is about to reach 350 appearances in Madrid, where he has won the Champions League four times, made the FIFA World Eleven five times, and ended the Messi and Ronaldo stronghold over the Ballon d'Or. Many Real Madrid fans who had written Modric off now hold him dear as one of the club's finest players of the modern era. Modric was reinvented under Carlo Ancelotti as more of an 8 than a 10, and we have him to thank in part for one of the finest midfielders of a generation. Granit Xhaka Staying in central midfield, it would be fair to say that Granit Xhaka hasn't quite eclipsed the achievements of Luka Modric just yet, or got remotely close, but I still think that he has proven an awful lot of people wrong. Xhaka has now been at Arsenal for more than four years, having arrived to much excitement in the summer of 2016. Despite the odd thunderbolt from range though, Xhaka was largely underwhelming. Neither the most creative on the ball, nor the most destructive out of possession, some had been left wondering what Xhaka actually brought to the Gunners starting 11. The height of anti-Xhaka sentiment occurred almost a year ago, in October 2019, when he was substituted in a game against Crystal Palace. Some supporters cheered ironically when Xhaka's number came up on the board, and the Gunners captain responded by telling them to f*** off twice, before throwing his shirt to the ground and heading straight down the tunnel. A week later, he was stripped of his captaincy, and it seemed as though the Swiss international time in North London may have been up. That hasn't proved to be the case, however, and he has now found arguably his best form for the club under Mikel Arteta. Xhaka has started to show for the ball a lot more often, play little combinations, and is beginning to dictate the tempo of games. I'm not suggesting that he's Paul Scholes or Pep Guardiola, but Xhaka has made a superb comeback that few would have foreseen 12 months ago. Chira Mobile. It's always a danger to write off a once prolific centre forward, since strikers tend to blow hot and cold so often. Chiro Mobile blew hotter than a supernova last season, scoring more league goals than anyone else in Europe's top five leagues. Just four or five years ago though, things looked very different for the Italian. Following a glut of goals for Torino, Immobile was brought to Borussia Dortmund by Jurgen Klopp. 
Dortmund has been a centre-forwards paradise in recent years, but it didn't prove to be the case for Immobile, who scored 10 goals in 34 games in all competitions, but only three goals across an entire season in the Bundesliga. He was swiftly sold to Sevilla, where Immobile only scored four goals in 15 games before they too offloaded him for a loss as Immobile slinked off back to Serie A. Lazio were Immobile's new suitors, and it didn't take him long to get back into the swing of things. Despite his struggles in Germany and Spain, the eagle-eyed poacher found the back of the net 26 times in his debut campaign, and there were even bigger things to come. In total, Immobile has scored 126 goals in 180 games for Lazio, and no one has scored more in the top flight of Italian football since the 30-year-old arrived in Rome. From a Dortmund and Sevilla flop to a multiple-time Serie A top scorer and Lazio player of the year, Lazio returned to the Champions League this season, and Immobile will be hoping to prove his class against Europe's elite following his prior struggles outside of Italy. Jordan Henderson I can't think of anyone who has more emphatically proven people wrong at the top end of English football in recent years than Jordan Henderson, and I would include myself among the people he has proved wrong. Make no mistake, I wasn't someone who thought Henderson was a waste of space who wasn't fit to play for Liverpool, but there was certainly a time in which I would have said his ceiling was being a solid top six midfielder who would look out of his depth in any of Europe's genuine top teams. Well, Henderson is now playing for undoubtedly one of Europe's top teams, and he doesn't look remotely out of place. Quite the contrary, in fact, Liverpool look a shadow of their best when Henderson isn't in their starting 11, with his organisational and leadership skills often guiding the Reds through games. That isn't to underestimate the rest of Henderson's game, since he has also developed into a brilliant reader of the game and a really purposeful passer of a ball. Henderson's transformation, I think, came in the 2017-18 season, and for the last three years, I think he's been one of the most consistent and impressive central midfielders in Europe. From having his running style questioned by Alex Ferguson, to constant and helpful comparisons with Steven Gerrard, Henderson has confounded plenty of doubters through his fantastic attitude and work rate, and he deserves all of the plaudits that he now receives. Andrea Perlo Described by Gianluigi Buffon as the signing of the century, picking up Andrea Perlo when he had just turned 32 on a free transfer was like all of Juventus' Christmases coming at once. The midfield metronome, who could control a game in his sleep, came on the market after he and AC Milan had failed to agree a contract extension. According to reports, Milan felt Perlo's best days were behind him and he only played 17 league games under Massimiliano Allegri, partly due to injuries, in his final season. AC Milan may have felt injuries were going to plague the Italians' playing days over the next few years, but Juventus had no such concerns, and they wasted no time in offering Perlo a three-year deal. AC Milan's concerns proved to be just as mental as they had always seemed. A lack of pace was never likely to be a problem for Perlo, who broke sweat about twice a season and could beat a man while standing still. For three seasons at Juventus, Perlo barely suffered a scratch, as he helped re-establish Juve as the dominant force within Italian football, as arguably the finest midfielder in Serie A. In his fourth and final season in Turin, Perlo did suffer one medium-term setback, but he still played 33 games and was an absolute class act. In 2012, Perlo came seventh in Ballon d'Or voting, and by the time he won his fourth Serie A title with Juventus, AC Milan, had descended into mid-table mediocrity with a midfield composed primarily of Nigel de Jong, Andrea Poli, and either Marco van Hinkel or Sully Montari. Perlo went on to spend a couple of years with NYCFC in the MLS, and he obviously now manages the events as first team. David De Gea If you were to plot David De Gea's career on a graph, it would probably look something like this. Lots of promise early on with Atletico Madrid, serious doubts about his ability to cut it in the Premier League with Manchester United, then he becomes the club's best player, by far, and a contender for the best goalkeeper on earth, before letting a tame Cristiano Ronaldo strike past him at the 2018 World Cup, where he was generally poor, and he has struggled with inconsistency and a flutter of errors ever since. That may be a gross oversimplification, but I think it's a reasonable overview. And naturally, it is his first few scenes at Manchester United that are the subject of De Gea's inclusion in this seven. Some people felt Alex Ferguson may have pulled another Massimo Taibi out of the bag when De Gea arrived at Old Trafford, primarily due to the Spaniards' inability to claim crosses into the box and the apparent ill-ease that he seemed to spread among his back four. Fergie stuck by his young new recruit though, with the exception of some early rotation with Anders Lindegaard, and De Gea would repay the club tenfold. By his second season, De Gea had already proved the doubters wrong, but from the 2013-14 through to the 2017-18 campaigns, De Gea was absolutely phenomenal. 
He won the Manchester United Player of the Year award an all-time record four times in the space of just five seasons, and any subsequent struggles do not detract from those five years of excellence. Peter Crouch I was going to reserve top spot for Danny Ings in this seven, which clearly has no defined order and is just made up of a horribly Premier League-centric seven that I wanted to talk about. But in the end, I've plumped for Peter Crouch. Peter Crouch probably endured a more difficult journey to the top than most Premier League footballers and England internationals, which is always likely to be the case when you're 6 feet and 7 inches tall, but weigh under 12 stone. Crouch has described some of the ways in which he was stereotyped throughout his career, and some of the abuse that he had aimed in his direction, with supporters shouting words like freak at him, even at a very early age. Crouch defined many doubters just to make it in the professional ranks, scoring prolifically for Southampton in the first division in a season that really propelled his career. In March 2002, Crouch was signed by Aston Villa for £5 million, a huge fee for a second-tier footballer at the time. However, over the next couple of years, Crouch could only score six goals in 43 games at Villa Park, leading many to believe that Crouch was just a big man who could do a job in the lower leagues, but wasn't up to the standard of the top flight. Crouch was sold to Southampton for just £2.5 million, where he remained a peripheral figure up until the arrival of his former Portsmouth boss, Harry Redknapp. Under Redknapp, Crouch proved that he could score goals in the Premier League, earning a move to Liverpool. At the peak of his powers during the mid-2000s, Crouch scored 18 goals in a single season for the Reds and a remarkable 11 goals in 12 games for England in a single year. The towering frontman remained in the game up until last summer, retiring age 38, having scored more than 100 Premier League goals as the division's leading headed goalscorer of the Premier League era, and he sits among the top 20 goalscorers for the England national team of all time. So that's it for today's video. Thank you all as ever for watching, feel free to give the video a like if you enjoyed it, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section, and please do subscribe to HITC7s and turn on notifications. Uh, and you can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram, where the username is just at HITC7s on both.